In part 1 of this video, we covered the events that spawned MF Doom's resentment for the music industry, and how those events brought about Doom's declaration of war against the rap industry with the release of Operation Doomsday. Now that we have a better understanding of Doom's motives, we can analyze some of the ways Doom sought to get revenge on the same industry that had once casted him aside. And now I keep the revenge on the one who forced me to hide behind this mask. Having learned from his prior experiences, Doom re-emerged with a different approach when it came to dealing with record companies. Instead of seeking out major labels like the ones that had turned him down previously, Doom instead chose to partner up with independent labels, like the one he had released Operation Doomsday with. Unlike massive media conglomerates, independent labels are able to function free from corporate control, not needing to answer to some sort of parent company like Electro at Warner Music. Instead, independent labels are able to give their artists autonomy, allowing them to present their vision unfiltered and uncensored. One such label was Insomniac Music. In mid-2004, sandwiched between Mad Villainy and Mmm Food, Doom signed to Insomniac under his alias of Victor Vaughn. On top of creative freedom, independent labels are more lenient with their contracts. This of course allowed Doom a lot more leeway when negotiating a deal. Typically, a major label obviously doesn't want their artists two-timing them by signing to multiple record companies. With independent labels, Doom was able to get away with signing one label to Victor Vaughn, while signing another label to Metal Fingers, and so on. The case for Venomous Villain is especially interesting considering the context. Doom was hot off the critical acclaim of Mad Villainy. Plus, this new album would have been a follow-up to another beloved underground classic. Insomniac was probably thrilled to present the next great Victor Vaughn project. Dub it off your man, don't spend that 10 bucks, I did it for the advance, the back end sucked. Yeah, and it sucked. Not only because there's kind of an overall lack of material on this thing, but also the cover makes me think I'm about to listen to a knockoff of the artist who made Vaudeville Villain. Doom pretty much just gave this label an album composed of leftovers, took their money, and a few years later, Insomniac goes out of business. What? No money? I'm not saying that's Doom's fault, but I'm assuming Insomniac probably paid him more money than they should have, especially for what they received. I wouldn't be surprised if Doom took this approach whenever possible shopping around for labels who would offer him the best deal and the most amount of money. Especially as Doom's legend began to grow. He probably had labels tripping over themselves to outbid one another for his next project. In an interview with Hip Hop Connection, Doom was asked, why are you always moving from one label to the next? He said this. At the time, these labels don't be having enough dough like that, so, alright, it's like five different labels is fucking with us. I'm signing labels, it's on that shit, but really, it's just that work ethic to where I'm not turning down work. It's only writing. So if somebody wants to hear something, I'll find something for you. A significantly more controversial use of Doom's villainy against the music industry is what fans have dubbed Doom Bots. In the Marvel Universe, Doom Bots are a series of highly advanced sentient AI created by Doctor Doom to take his place in specific scenarios. Similarly, MF Doom has been known to send his own version of Doom Bots to perform live on his behalf. Do a show, same time, watch it. This is more controversial for obvious reasons, since it's no longer a company that Doom is ripping off, but the fans themselves. Doom has rendered multiple explanations for his use of imposters at live shows. For one, if a venue doesn't put up enough money, Doom won't show up and will instead send one of his Doom bots to perform in his place. This however has proven to be a flimsy excuse at best, as seen with the UK based promoter Living Proof. Back in August of 2012, the team at Living Proof got in contact with Doom's management and booked them to perform live at their venue, only for Doom's management to inform them the morning of the show that Doom was refusing to show up unless he got more money. Despite it being a clear breach in their agreement, Living Proof agreed to cough up what they described as a ransom. They knew getting Doom to show up was worth it, it'd be a memorable night for the fans and all other parties involved. The evening rolls around and doors open for the attendees. Shortly afterwards, Doom's management informs the venue that Doom will appear but he won't be DJing nor will he be signing autographs. To Living Proof, this was unacceptable. Not signing autographs is one thing, but they had paid up front for Doom's performance, including his DJing. But at this point, what could they really do about it? To add insult to injury, as you may have guessed, the person who showed up wasn't even the actual MF Doom. Doing this show has taught us a lot about how some artists operate, and how they feel and they can treat others, and most importantly, their fans. As fans of Doom ourselves, this has left a very sour taste in our mouth. The second explanation given by Doom is the more widely accepted one. In several interviews, Doom has claimed that his use of Doom bots is all part of his character, and as such, justified his actions. 
In a 2009 interview with Hip Hop DX, Doom was questioned on his use of stand-ins at live shows and had this to say. I liken it to this. I'm a director as well as a writer. I choose different characters, I choose the directions and where I want to put them. So, who I choose to put as a character is up to me. The character that I hired, he got paid for it. There's no imposter. In a separate interview with Rolling Stone earlier that year, Doom spoke about his use of imposters for the first time, saying this. I'll tell you one thing, when you come to a Doom show, come expecting to hear music. Don't come here to see. You never know who you might see. It has nothing to do with a visual thing. Realistically, I think this explanation is accepted because it's more fun, fits into Doom's lore, and it's definitely an easier pill to swallow than the fact that you just got finessed by your favorite artist. Only for you to go home and listen to this line. Plot shows like robberies, in and out, one, two, three, nobody's please. I will say though, while I don't like the way Doom went about his use of Doom bots, there is something to be said for what Doom was trying to express here. But that's a topic for another video. What I did was I said, all right, look, I'm gonna come with the angle of it don't matter what I look like, you know, it don't matter what the artists look like, it's more what the artists sound like. And at the same time, it, you know, it, it's something different, you know what I'm saying? And it fits with the theme of the rebel, the villain. Where, you know, to him, he don't care about the fame and all that shit. That shit is of no consequence, you know what I mean? And it's still entertaining. It's still like the theater and it has the appeal of, uh, you know, something that could be considered entertaining. But that message is still there that, yo, you know, villain represents anybody. Anybody in here could wear the mask and be a villain, male, female, any race, so-called race, you know what I mean? MF Doom has always had a close association with the Adult Swim family, from voicing characters on shows to the use of his music and even his own Christmas special. But of course, the most well-known example of Doom and Adult Swim's partnership is the album The Mouse and the Mask. Released in 2005, the collaborative Danger Doom album was produced in tandem with Adult Swim. And similarly to Venomous Villain, Doom has a line referring to his exploited dealings. Walk on the freeway, villain find a way to make him pay whatever we say. Similarly to how the opening line on the track, the back end, is a reference to Venomous Villain 2, I wouldn't be surprised if this line was some sort of reference to his negotiations with Adult Swim for the Mouse and the Mask, forcing the network to meet whatever figure he wanted for the album. The similarities to Venomous Villain don't end there. While on the back end, Vaughn warns the listener to not buy the album, Doom takes it a step further on here, flat out insulting and taunting the listener for even buying the album. Why did you buy this album? I don't know why you did, you're stupid. F yourself. <laughs> this however only begins to scratch the surface of Doom's dastardly dealings with Adult Swim. The first time Adult Swim at least received an album for their payment, they wouldn't be so lucky the second time around. Everyone knows about the mouse and the mask. Less known however is the fact that Doom and Adult Swim actually had a second collaboration album planned. After the massive success that was the Danger Doom album, Jason DeMarco of Adult Swim proposed the brilliant idea of signing Doom to the network. Knowing MF was a huge fan of classic cartoons, DeMarco reasoned that under Adult Swim, Doom would have unrestricted access to Time Warner's catalog of Hanna-Barbera cartoons. Cartoons which Doom would be able to pull from without needing to go through the hassle of clearing the samples. An issue that Doom actually ran into back in 2004 with the track Cookies, which originally had a Sesame Street sample which Doom was forced to remove. Cookies! Supposed to be checking emails. All I got is messages from ass naked females. Cookies! I don't know no Jenny. She said it's Getting to make an album with unlimited use of his favorite classic cartoons on top of getting paid for it? Of course, Doom loved the idea, and he agreed. Adult Swim hooked him up with a $45,000 advance, $65,000 in today's money, and then he ghosted them. <laughs> Remarkably, DeMarco wasn't fired for this blunder, but he did catch a lot of heat for it. I heard nothing from him and didn't get my phone calls returned for like three years, after which he would call me and I wouldn't return his phone calls. I got in a lot of trouble for wasting $45,000 of the company's money, but I weathered it. It hurt though. Somewhere in the time frame where I wasn't speaking to him, Doom sent me two huge paintings he made. They're still hanging at work, with Bonner over loving cartoons. And he had wanted to honor that and I guess say I'm sorry? I later found out that during the time he had split, he had a child who was in the hospital and was deathly ill. That softened my heart somewhat. After ghosting Adult Swim, it would take roughly 10 years for the dust to finally settle. It was around this time that DeMarco had caught wind that Doom was interested in working with him again. Miraculously, DeMarco somehow got the network on board to give Doom another shot. And after several talks with Doom's management, they came up with the idea of the infamous Missing Notebook Rhymes. 
but little did they know that the villain had one final trick up his sleeve for Adult Swim. You know, man, Doom comes from the Grand Poobah school of, of gaming the game. <laughs> and I got... Of course, Adult Swim quickly realized that there were some major issues with the material Doom handed them to release. For one, despite telling the network that the songs were cleared for release, Doom hadn't actually paid the producers who made the tracks, nor did he clear the samples that were used. On top of this, it turned out that Doom still owed music to a record label. According to DeMarco, any music Doom released would instantly belong to this label. As a result, Adult Swim had to pay an unspecified amount of money to this label, producers, and sample holders. Whoa, 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 calm down! It's a prank, you big head prick! I again got yelled at by my bosses who asked, why would you go back to this guy? Which is a valid question. All I could say was, it's Doom, he's one of the greatest to ever do it, and I was just hoping we could make it work. I've been thinking about what happened a lot, even before hearing about his death. And you know what? I'm not sorry I gave him another shot, even if it didn't work out for me. Doom was a mess, and a genius, and a goofball who loved cartoons, and I loved him even though he fucked us over because he was just that special. Pour one out for the supervillain. Rest in peace. A little bonus way that Doom got to dig at the rap industry was with how he abstained from and mocked many of the genre's traditions. I'll go over two of each. For one, there's of course the genius opening track, Beef Rap. I haven't eaten all day, how am I gonna do this? Yeah, Aside from being a clever double entendre, the song touches on multiple subjects pertaining to rap beef, like poking fun at egotistical and overly emotional rappers who partake in disputes with other artists, especially phony beefs fabricated to drive up sales. Rap these days is like a pain up in the neck. Cornier and phonier than a play fight. Oh yeah, beef rap. Good song. Good choice. I just think it's a funny word. I don't get angry at this point. So rap beef is like whatever. The fact that there's two things that correlate there gave me enough metaphors to play with. But it's all fun. I always do it with something that's fun. Anger is something I don't deal with. Matter of fact, it's a little rap beef starting right now with um with Vic and Doom. Vic is kind of plotting on him. I think he's getting a little jealous because Doom's getting shine. Like he, so it's going to be a point where, I, you know, just to make a kind of like a mockery or kind of like a spoof from the, you know, the hip-hop rivalries that go on. One of my favorite ways Doom abstained from industry norms was with how he chose to spend his money. For decades now, it's become a staple in the rap world to blow a lot of your money on ridiculous chains. Your diamond-encrusted... Uh, Jake the dog from Adventure Time is not an investment. Doom commonly dropped lyrics where he would look down on materialistic rappers who waste their money on flashy jewelry. Order a rapper for lunch and spit out the chain. Instead of buying expensive jewelry to flex on people he doesn't even like, Doom took a different approach, choosing to downplay his wealth and probably investing his money in more intelligent ways. Never try to do something to impress the next the next man, you know, you know, the next woman like the best MC with no chain you ever heard. A more comical example of Doom's mockery of the industry is with the track Rap Snitch Canicious, where Doom and Mr. Fantastic make fun of rappers who dry snitch by confessing to their crimes and lyrics. Aside from being a hilarious poke at rappers, the track has proven prophetic, holding true with rappers like Young Thug, YNW Melly, Bobby Shmurda, 6 9 TK, and many others being indicted with prosecutors using their lyrics as partial evidence. A predicate's up the ass, a fucking Rico case, dirty to life. One of the more prominent ways Doom refused to partake in the genre's traditions was with how he portrayed himself. Doom re-emerged onto the scene during a time when image and status were everything to the average rapper. Doom instead chose to swerve this meaningless fight for status by obscuring his face and focusing on the quality of his art. Yeah, the whole mask thing, really, it, 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 it's a time in hip-hop where things, from my point of view, started going more to what things look like opposed to what things sound like. To me, from the musical aspect, hip-hop is one of the directions to where it's, it's like 100 or almost damn near 100% on everything besides the music, like what you look like, the sound of your name, to what you're wearing, the brand of clothing, the what, whatever you, intoxicants you choose to put in your body, to, you know, things, everything except for what the music sounds like. So the mass is really a testament to, yo, it's not, it, it's not about none of that, it's straight about the wreck. In my opinion, this approach has given Doom's music significantly more longevity than any Bling era rapper. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to check out part 1, 
has a bunch of insight from research I did on KMD, and it'll put Doom's career into context. And of course, a special thank you to my channel members and patrons over on Patreon. Tad Onchi, Kaboo Saibot, The Wingman, Jesse Pigal, Bobby Novoa, Jay Murray, Don Did, Dylan Sanders, Conda, Corazon, Aaron Jones, Fanboy, High Rise Para, Doug, Geezer, and Vinicius Nakif. Sorry if I butchered your name. Thank you all for your continuous support.